Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Turner. I'm the director of the China Environment Forum here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. The Wilson Center has been around since 1968. It was created by Congress. So instead of create, making a statue for pigeons, they created a foreign policy think tank in honor of our 28th president, who, in case you don't know, Sam, maybe you don't know this trivia. You've seen you're from the other side of the pond, that he was our only PhD president. Yeah, we've got 20 projects and programs here. China Environment Forum has been around for almost 22 years, and I'm starting my 20th year in September. Woohoo! Uh, yeah, and so we explore lots of different issues on China's energy and environmental challenge. Challenges have dug deep in water energy nexus, U.S.-China climate cooperation, and like a lot of other organizations here in D.C., I've packed my bag and I'm heading on the road. The Belt and Road Initiative, China's the world's largest investment infrastructure project um, is, is, is growing every day, anywhere between 65 and 70 countries. They just, I'm sure if, since you're here, a lot of you probably been monitoring the, um, the second Belt and Road Forum. Yes, knowledge from the audience, it was riveting. Um, but if you, if you paid attention, in the middle of all these speeches, there was, there was a lot, there seemed to be a lot more mention of climate issues and talk about getting NGOs involved, doing more in these projects, you know, pre-project approval. So a lot of it was sounding the, the co-how. The slogan sounded a little bit more in the direction you wanted to go if you're concerned about energy, environment, and social impacts. A little short on detail. Mm. So we don't know about operationalizing. So today, we are going to shine a light on a greener Belt and Road, honing in on the potential for Chinese solar power investments in Southeast Asia. I mean, the, the impetus for this project, well, it's, it's, we've got the troublemaker, troublemakers at Stimson who have been pondering for a while in their work in the Mekong on how to bring China's cleaner and greener lessons there. Darren McGee, who also tromps around in Yunnan and Southeast Asia, also thought of, been thinking on these questions, right? Writing, just a, a little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, wait, you mean I invited you to speak and you're not doing this? I'm work? just making this up. Okay, good, yeah, so Darren is making it up. He's the humorous insert today in our speaker lineup. And then Sam from China Dialogue has, has, has definitely been, been doing a lot more going to Myanmar and trying to investigate the idea of bringing some of China's successes in terms of solar power into China. So that was the quick overview of the, the stories that my speakers are gonna tell, but I, I should tell a little more that Sam, besides being a chief, what, what you're, executive editor, didn't know like what your, what crown you wore there these days. Executive editor, China Dialogue, and I know if you're in the room today, you all read China Dialogue. Um, the best, the best of the best in terms of environmental reporting and research on China's problems, global climate. They have an oceans project there in Latin America. Like BRI, you are also taking over the world, China Dialogue. Um, so, so, but he's also a research fellow on low carbon innovation at the China, at in China at the Science and Technology Policy Research Program at the University of Sussex. But he's not starting. You are actually my middle guy. Starting today is actually we're going to have Courtney. I was reading alphabetical order. So Courtney, Court, almost Courtney. Courtney Weatherby, she's a research analyst at the Stimson's Center on Southeast Asia and Energy, Water, and Sustainability <laughs> Program. Fo you focus a lot on, on sustainable infrastructure and have gone swimming a lot in the water energy nexus issue yes, in Southeast much. Asia. Speak, chi deep. speak Chinese, diving deep. And uh, she's, she's going to kick us off today, kind of get us to set the stage on the need, the potential of renewable energy in Southeast Asia. She will then be followed by Sam, who I already introduced, who's going to talk about what's happening in China in terms of maybe small innovations on small solar. And Darren McGee, he's our closing pitcher today. Gee, what are you going to talk about since you're just making this up? Well, Darren McGee, I'll just tell you who you are. Darren McGee is an associate professor of environmental studies at the Hobart, William, and Smith Colleges. He's done lots and lots of research on energy resources and environment in China. I think last time I had him here, I had him say, how, it was a meeting for how, did, how, did, how many light bulbs does it take does to, take change, to change, change China? China. That's right. um, yeah, so he does lots on energy and environment in China. He, was, he did damn research in, in Yunnan province. Damn good. He did damn good research in Yunnan province on hydropower construction. And he's going to close us out looking at the kinds of potential of the, the joining of the joining of the grids, the kumbaya of grid, and how the energy flows could maybe lead to more sustainable energy. So with that intro, we're ready to take them on. Courtney? Oh, and your job, ladies and gentlemen, is to ask difficult and challenging questions, particularly of Darren, since he clearly didn't come prepared today. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> He's really prepared. All right, Courtney, where, where do you want to go? Stand or I'll, sit? I'll go ahead. She's going to come up and stand. All right, so a little applause for my speakers to encourage them. 
man. Man. Roasting you. <laughs> so thanks for that introduction, Jennifer. And without much further ado, I will go ahead and start digging into the current energy trends in Southeast Asia and the opportunity that that really presents for renewable energy investment from China and from elsewhere. So a little bit about the regional energy context. As many of you know, Southeast Asia's energy demand is rapidly rising. The estimated needs are expected to rise from about 240 gigawatts of installed capacity in 2017 to about 565 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030. So it's a significant rise. It's a rapid rise. For many countries, that's a double-digit annual energy demand growth when you're looking to Cambodia, for instance, in Myanmar, um, and still high but larger increases um, in amounts, if not in percentages, for Indonesia and Vietnam. So it's a significant challenge for the region. Um, at the same time, the energy context is shifting rapidly. We've all seen the price of renewable energy technologies, particularly solar and wind, drop significantly in recent years. Uh, since 2009, it's been about an 86% drop for solar. Uh, much of that has happened since 2016. So it's really just a, s a snowballing effect that it really has to impact these countries' energy plans. Um, innovations in energy transmission and distributed grid technology are changing the way that energy planning works on a national basis. It's no longer a requirement that you have centralized power plants producing electricity going to a central demand point in cities. You can now have microgrids, connected mini grids, um, and a much broader and more flexible energy system for these countries, particularly developing countries in Southeast Asia, which many, many of which are coming from a fairly low starting point for installed energy transmission. At the same time, we're seeing a shift in hydropower and coal externalities being recognized by policymakers and the public in many countries throughout the region. If you look at Thailand, for instance, we've seen ongoing protests against coal plants in Krabi that has ultimately resented in those projects being suspended, and now it looks to be taken off entirely and replaced with natural gas and renewables in the next power development plan for Thailand. So these are having a real impact, particularly in countries where the democratic process allows for these inputs to, to feed into government planning. And finally, adaptation to these shifts for Southeast Asia and for other developing countries around the world really will require a shift in thinking. It will require whole system planning where you're not looking at one energy, um, that one, one energy type, for instance, hydropower planning, separately from other energy types. And it's going to th require thinking on a regional basis for efficiency purposes. When we're looking at the actual investment needs for the region, I think it's useful to consider the, the breakdown of that. So the international energy agencies estimated that Southeast Asia needs between 2.7 and 2.9 trillion dollars of en investment in energy infrastructure through 2030. And the difference between those two estimates is really climate resilience. Um, it, the number increases to 2.9 million from 2.7 if you account for the need for um, climate resilience, and that is both a shift towards renewable energy as well as retrofitting existing energy transmission and power plants to be more resilient in the face of climate impacts like drought or, in some cases, sea level rise. Only $570 billion of that is for generation. The majority is actually for energy transmission um, to build a resilient grid and also for retrofitting buildings and including energy efficiency measures to reduce the overall amount of energy that's required. But regardless, it's still a very significant amount of investment. Um, ASEAN as a whole, if you're looking at the projected um, expenses that should be coming from the public sector here, it should be around 5 to 6% if you look at what, what the IEA is estimating. In reality, it's about half that. It's between 2 and 3% for most of the ASEAN countries. So when you're looking at the chart here, you can see that's the breakdown for each year from 2017 to 2030, the amount of investment needed each year. So it's, it's a little over $200 billion of investment each year. Um, and just for reference, I thought it was useful to actually compare what all of the multinational development banks, China's BRI, the US OPEC, and then the new DFC actually contribute on an annual basis to energy infrastructure. And it's important to note when you look at this breakdown here, this is an exceptionally optimistic perspective that says if almost all of their investment on a yearly basis was channeled specifically towards Southeast Asia, they would make up about 26% of the energy needs. So what this chart is really showing is that the public sector investment needs to stay at the rate or even increase the rate that it's currently 
making because it's only about 24% of the needs and ultimately that the private sector is going to have to make up the gap there. So the private sector needs to be brought in. And that's not just the private sector as it's spoken of here. We're thinking American companies, Japanese companies. It really does require Chinese companies to be playing a role in this space. There is space for everybody. So I think when we're looking at BRI and sort of the US FOIP and other energy initiatives under that, the point is often lost that it's it's not just competition for the same projects in a static space. It's competition for the type of projects and the standards that are used for these energy projects in a much broader space. And there is space for everybody to help play a role in meeting the region's energy needs because they are so significant. So looking to China's energy investments in the region. As I think many of us know, China plays a key role in regional energy development. When you're looking at, for instance, the coal sector, I think there's a report that just showed China plays a role in about one quarter of all of the coal projects around the world. That is more than true for Southeast Asia, whereas our own survey of projects has shown that for the Mekong countries, China is involved in, I think it was 43% of the coal projects in the region. So China plays an outsized role, both in meeting the region's energy demand at large and specifically in meeting fossil fuel investments and in hydropower investments for the region. Um, so when you're looking at China's Belt and Road investments globally, the uh, Boston University's uh, database tracking here shows that they've spent about $245 billion on energy, and that much of that has been in fossil fuels. You can see at the top oil, gas, and coal are sort of the three largest. Hydropower is the fourth, and the solar and wind very small percentages of China's investments globally. This does hold true in Southeast Asia as well. Um, BRI financing or Chinese financing more broadly, as it predates BRI in Southeast Asia, has very much been targeted in the coal and hydropower sectors. And looking specifically at the developing countries in the Mekong, uh, you can see here this pipeline of Chinese power generation projects. Um, if you're looking at the, the gray is potential projects, and you can see the vast majority of China's investment, both to date and into the future, is in the hydropower sector. Most of that's in Myanmar, but a significant portion of that has also been, uh, particularly in the existing and under construction pipeline in, in Laos and in Cambodia, and the broader Mekong system. So there's, there's a history of China being involved in the region, but it's in relatively outdated technologies. It's in coal, it's in hydropower, it's not necessarily in supercritical coal or advanced hydropower that's built in a cascade format. Um, and it's, it's essentially posing a challenge for the region. And at the same time, I think Sam and Darren will talk about this in more depth, we all know China's gone through a solar revolution domestically. Um, China's now a leading investor in solar. They made advancements, and China's been a key uh, factor in driving the price of solar down. So there's clear opportunity for China to play a larger role in Southeast Asia's role of renewables broadly and of solar in particular. And just to touch again on those energy shifts because I think it's important to consider the rapidity of the price drops and the role that China has played here as factors in why Southeast Asia has been somewhat slow to adopt solar but is now seeing rising momentum. So the solar price dropped about 80, I think this chart says 80%, I think the newest figure is 86% uh, since 2009. Wind has dropped a little over 65%. Um, it's a very rapid price drop. And if you look, the, the most significant portion of that that really puts solar and wind in competition with fossil fuel and new hydropower projects has come in just the last few years, really since 2015 and 2016. That's significant for Southeast Asia because broadly speaking, Energy planning happens on a regular schedule for most countries in the region. And many countries, Vietnam and Thailand included, last really updated their national energy plans before these price drops were a known reality or were trusted figures by the, the, the people who are making decisions in the energy sector, from the Ministry of Energy or Ministry of Industry and Trade. And so those price drops really weren't fully accounted for when they were looking at energy targets for solar and wind. That's really started to shift just in the last two years, as these figures are now not just from last year. Many of these projects are now getting off the ground, and you can start seeing the way that they're integrating into systems as case studies from other countries. So Thailand has shifted its national energy targets from 20% coming from renewables, which for Thailand is biomass, solar, and wind, mostly solar, um, to about 30%. Vietnam has instituted, as of 2017, a feed-in tariff for solar that's resulted in 17,000 megawatts 
of signed MOUs for projects. Certainly not all of those will go forward, but it does show that when the countries start responding and adjusting the national policies, the investment will come in. So the investor interest is there. Um, moving forward, many of the countries in the ASEAN region are starting to shift from feed-in tariffs, which are now viewed globally as a somewhat outdated method of, of getting into solar and renew renewable energy, and towards an auction system, which is where you truly see the price drops that make these competitive on a price basis with older technologies. So looking to the future, China potentially has a key role to play here. China has signed on for some projects in the region. Most notably, there's a solar project, a 60 megawatt solar project in Cambodia that's coming online this year that's Chinese invested, and it's going to help address the rolling blackouts that Cambodia has been facing due to drought impacting hydropower production. So China is playing a role in some specific economies. But China is not playing the outsized role that we would expect to see in solar, similar to the way that it has in coal or hydro. So there is an opportunity moving forward if China's Belt and Road policymakers are serious about greening the Belt and Road to shift the type of investments that they've, they're they doing, particularly in Southeast Asia, which is right in their backyard and which has an investment environment that they're truly familiar with. So I'm going to go ahead and end there. Um, my contact information is up here, but you guys have plenty of opportunity to ask questions during the rest of the panel, and I will turn it over to our next speaker. All right. Sam. And just so you know, all of the PowerPoints will be online, so you can, you know, dig into the data later. All right, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction. Thank you, Courtney. Push, 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 the, push, the, push this up yeah, slightly. Just slightly. There you go. Thanks. All right. Good. Good. Um, so I wanted to start by Here's sort of cast screen. Oh, cool. By casting our mind back to a, a sort of moment in late 2017. Um, that was Xi Jinping's speech to the 19th Party Congress, um, when specifically he said that China is now in the driver's seat on international climate cooperation. And to just to kind of think for a minute where that fell historically and what that meant and, and what we can kind of divine from that in terms of China's own, the importance of China's climate change policies and, and where they fit within national industrial priorities and so on. I mean, the context is essentially that, of course, you know, countries had reached, 190 countries, no less, had reached this, you know, historic agreement in Paris in late 2015, um, under, uh, underpinned in no small part by Xi Jinping and Barack Obama's um, Sunnyland Summit and joint announcement in, in 2014, um, and had, of course, committed, you know, the world to a uh, meeting a two degree target, best efforts to come in at 1.5. Um, and that this had been profoundly disrupted in late 2016 by Trump's election and then by his announcement in early 2017 that the US uh, intends to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And you know there were a few critical moments after that where, where China sort of made a signal that no, we're actually gonna double down on this. And actually the first was probably Xi Jinping's speech at Davos in early tw 2017, where he said China's still committed to staying in the Paris Agreement, was kind of um, welcomed by many as sort of upholding the liberal international order, maybe naively. But <laughs> nevertheless, in at the 19th Party Congress, there was this really pretty interesting speech where not only did Xi Jinping again sort of double down on the commitment to Paris, but kind of went further mentioning environment repeatedly throughout, you know, more than three hours of a speech, more than the word economy, whether you, whether you think that's significant or not, talking about um, the central contradiction of um, China's um, uh, strategy as being about balancing growth rather than just um, uh, trying to unleash productive forces in the economy. And, uh, and this idea of China actually now being in a leading position and at the same time, significantly, and I'll come back to this, talking about um, China's 2020 poverty alleviation goal, which is a central goal. And if you actually, you know, reading kind of day to day what's what's in Chinese state media, it's a it's a constant kind of drumbeat that there is this poverty eradication goal uh, kind of taking place. And I think it's important then to think, okay, so why at that moment was um, Xi Jinping happy in a context where? Um, there's a, something of a, of a leadership vacuum and actually 
China, you know, sort of by default became a, uh, a, a leader on, uh, on climate change policy, given that the U.S. had kind of retreated. Um, and, uh, and, and, and given uh, sort of the importance, for example, of China's signing on to the, to the Paris Agreement, you know, why signal that at that point? I think it's because it so fundamentally had already become a, a, a significant part of China's industrial policy and of China's economic policy, and that there was a strong understanding politically of the kind of political and economic co-benefits of climate change policy. And, you know, we can see those playing out in lots of different uh, realms, and people, you know, talk ab about, for example, you know, the, the ways in which climate change mitigation in China has co-benefits with air pollution mitigation, has various other uh, sort of political legitimacy types of co-benefits. But I think it's also important to look at how it fits with the kind of um, underlying economic drivers that you can see embedded in the 13 to five-year plan. 13 five-year plan to 2020 clearly also aligns very closely with China's own pledges to the Paris Agreement. Um, it's very much in line with, uh, with, with what they're pledged to in terms of uh, reducing the carbon intensity in the economy to, to 2030. All of this is kind of uh, very much in line. And specifically, there are strong commitments to what was called in the uh, 12th five-year plan strategic emerging industries. Um, and what is still given strong preferential support, which is uh, renewable energy and particularly solar. And as Courtney mentioned, there's been um, enormous you know, in, um, investment in solar and that led to um, you know, very significant kind of economic technological dynamics playing out, including essentially sort of plummeting prices for solar. And that of course, you know, when we're really talking about the kind of real economy changes that made it possible to sign the Paris Agreement, that's the other one. You've got, kind of got two, I would say, you know, how do we manage to sign the Paris Agreement in late 2015? You had this very significant moment when the two leading kind of superpowers in terms of carbon emissions acted as such and said, you know, as China and the US, as 40% of the world's emissions are happy to kind of um, step forward and take responsibility um, for, our, uh, for our joint emissions profile. You also had at the same time this uh, dramatic drop in the in the price of solar um, and of other uh, renewable energies that that actually formed a kind of real economy shift that made it possible to to talk about the transition in this way. China, of course, no small part of that, um, and you s saw as a result not only huge you know leading investment from from China but also leading uh, capacity additions in, uh, in in solar PV in particular um, over the last few years. In 2017 alone, China installed more solar capacity than the total cumulative solar capacity of any other country as of the end of 2016. So in absolutely enormous um, additions. But of course that came out about in, a, in you know, an industrial context that's playing out with all kinds of sort of market dynamics in China. And, and a, you know, not a small one was that solar had come about over, you know, over the past sort of 15, 20 years as a strong manufacturing industry led largely by private enterprise for export initially. Um, I, I won't do a, f you know, a full history of the solar industry, but just to sort of mention briefly, it, you know, it was kind of a roller coaster over that period and there was a, an, and there was a strong overproduction crisis, largely because of, well, there's a combination of factors including EU and, and US anti-dumping measures, uh, the financial crisis, various other reasons meant that essentially um, China was faced in the, in, um, in the past few years with, with rapidly creating a domestic market um, to absorb overcapacity for, uh, of, uh, of solar panels and created a, and experimented with a number of different policies to try to um, uh, create a sort of uptick in, uh, in installation and to avoid curtailment, uh, which is you know, essentially building large solar farms that are not connected to the grid, um, you know, thanks to, uh, say, sort of misaligned policies and so on. Um, and one policy that came about um, as a result of, um, of this sort of context of, of um, attempting to um, align the need for a strong domestic market for um, uh, uh, solar photo photovoltaic installation and achieving poverty alleviation goals was initially a pilot policy launched in 2014, Solar Energy for Poverty Alleviation Program, that was very quickly elevated to a national program in 2015. Um, and it 
it's largely been kind of under uh, reported and, and, and discussed. And I'm not going to do the whole kind of um, analysis on it now because I, I don't have time. And, and what I think is interesting is whether China can export some of its learning around this. Um, and that includes both both kind of good and bad in terms of the learning of what this looked like to, uh, you know, how, how this policy was designed, how the experience of implementing it has played out. Um, but I do think it, it provides an interesting sort of example of a of quite a progressive piece of policy making that aligned um, the ways in which um, solar PV can uh, fit with with development goals as well as with um, uh, with climate change mitigation. Very briefly, the thing about renewable energy technologies is not only do they help to mitigate climate change, but they can provide cheap and reliable energy to areas where grid-based provision is unreliable or otherwise prohibited by geography and high costs. They can improve energy availability. It can help with, uh, with economic resilience at, at the local level. It has strong um, alignment, therefore, with the needs of uh, of Mekong countries in particular, um, uh, with with developing Asian countries, um, you know, if if you look at the 17% um, uh, of the world that s uh, lacks electricity access, some 44% of of that is in developing Asia. Uh, countries like Myanmar um, come in uh, come in the lowest. Um, uh, there's some, uh, I think it's 57% maybe of 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 Myanmar uh, population lacks electricity access. It's the lowest in ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a strong need there, um, and a strong kind of alignment that can be found in uh, expanding electricity access through um, uh, the use of uh, of uh, renewables uh, that can avoid. Uh, uh, you know s some of the uh, kind of upfront costs and so on of building out a centralized um, grid. Now, the um, experience of solar energy for poverty alleviation. Um, if you want the long version, uh, you can read uh, the, uh, an article which I published um, last year uh, with uh, two uh, co-authors in Energy Research and Social Science. Um, the uh, short version of the policy is that um, it aims to fit with this 2020 goal for eradicating poverty in China. Um, by installing 10 gigawatts of capacity for 2 million households in 35,000 villages by 2020. And the idea is essentially to um, allow poor households to generate additional income by selling excess electricity back to the grid. They rolled this out through a number of pilots that had different structures, different financial vehicles, different uh, sorts of ways of doing this. Um, we, d we did a, a you know, fairly extensive kind of review of, of the way that the policies um, played out. Um, and uh, and I also went down to one of the uh, pilot counties to have a look at how it had been implemented. Um, you know, very briefly, this um, slide looks daunting, but it's actually quite um, it's actually quite simple. Um, you know, when when I teach about uh, Chinese environmental policy, I talk about this idea of fragmented authoritarianism. Very very you know basically, you know, people will be familiar with this sort of framework. It's essentially that uh, elite units. Uh, within Chinese policymaking will typically uh, ex um, get involved in a protracted bargaining process over the sort of allocation of resources that any policy initiative uh, brings about. And in the case of um, the solar energy for poverty alleviation policy, the blue lines there represent um, energy policymakers and the, uh, and, and the um, orange lines uh, represent the poverty alleviation department. And essentially, um, most of the resources were sort of allocated to um, energy regulators, and this was a, a policy framework that was largely guided by the need to absorb um, excess capacity in, uh, in in solar PV, rather than being informed by the uh, by poverty alleviation needs. As it turns out, when I went down to Guinan County in Qinghai to look at how this had played out, it essentially meant that the the kind of need to um, uh, keep absorbing overcapacity in solar uh, solar energy panels had sort of played out in a way that meant um, we essentially found a, a very large uh, solar farm which wasn't yet connected to the grid being sort of passed under this policy. So it's not a great um, example of, of, of implementation as it turns out. But we also did find um, extraordinary need and, uh, and, and requirements for um, uh, local energy access being met particularly by off-grid PV. Um, so for nomadic pastoralists in the area, they were uh, frequently using off-grid solar home systems. Um, you know, like pictured there, it's very simple. You know, a small uh, PV panel with a 
effect effectively a car battery um, being used for storage, uh, being used for mobile phone charging, watching television, uh, butter churning, which is, you know, this is a Tibetan area, so, so people are, uh, use, use butter a lot for um, nutrition <laughs> um, and, uh, and for uh, lighting. And these are mobile pastoralists, so uh, this is, it is particularly useful to have mobile systems that they can carry on, um, on horseback and so on, uh, move up to, uh, uh, to summer pastures. Interestingly, um, there could be a particularly, um, uh, a particularly useful kind of alignment with um, the, the, the central sort of model in the solar energy for poverty alleviation kind of program here, which is that, um, as in the, the, the home that's pictured here, uh, people typically have grid-connected winter homes. They're not in all, all year. In fact, they're not there during the summer months when uh, there's a lot of solar uh, radiation, at which point they could be selling that excess um, uh, capacity um, to the grid uh, for extra income could actually work very very nicely if it was implemented well. As we saw, it was, was not um, currently being implemented particularly effectively. Um, so, you know, to, to sort of come back to the central theme, I guess, um, you know, we have in, um, uh, at Paris, you know, to come back to that sort of, uh, that moment, a strong commitment to South-South cooperation from, uh, from China. China at Paris committed to, I think it was, what, $3.1 billion in climate finance. You know, I think it was, point, it was very deliberately 0.1 more than the uh, United States had committed to. <laughs> um, and there's been a number of sort of statements around uh, the ways that climate finance should play out. Um, it, at, you know, a, one of many summits I could have picked um, and, um, uh, you know, Ministry of Environment vice minister said that China and ASEAN should work together to build the Gre Green Belt and Road. We've seen a lot recently at the at the forum um, in Beijing uh, this week about um, the building of a Green Belt and Road. As it happens, though, there's ver been very little um, of this actually specifically sort of South-South um, climate finance dispersed. There's been a lot of, um, again, bureaucratic kind of protracted problems with actually how to get that finance spent on the ground. Um, there's, a, there's a politics to that as well. Of the few uh, projects that have actually, you know, come from that spending um, and have been spent in developing Asia um, in, in a, uh, a kind of um, a model that's, that's consistent with these sort of aims, there is, is one you could point to. It's very small. It's, I mean, it's value of some two, uh, two three million dollar, uh, you, know, you know, from that large fund, it's, it's, it's pretty small. Um, but it was implemented actually by a Chinese NGO, by the Global Environment Institute, who are based in, uh, in Beijing, um, in cooperation with the National Development um, and Reform Commission um, and, um, and, and ministries uh, on the ground in Myanmar. And, and it's specifically a um, solar energy for poverty alleviation project, uh, installing Chinese-made uh, solar panels um, in, uh, in northern Myanmar. So there, there have been um, cases that have, have kind of at least um, uh, pointed towards the ways in which um, in which we might be able to, to um, export that type of uh, model of solar energy for poverty alleviation um, on the ground through climate finance, but they're still um, you know few and far between. And of course, um, as you know, we heard in uh, in Courtney's presentation, the uh, predominant model still um, is the one that you see in in this in these stills from a uh, Belt and Road uh, rap propaganda video. Um, that I won't, I won't wrap it for you, but um, says that when the Belt and Road reaches um, the Putalam uh, coal-fired power plant, uh, Sri Lankans will no longer worry about high electricity bills. So, you know, this strong push for um, uh, coal as, a, uh, as an element of uh, investment, unfortunately, still uh, dominates the spending. Uh, this is one, uh, one study from World Resources Institute that indicates, you know, um, the extent to which the, the large loans from Chinese policy banks, from the Silk Road Fund, um, the spending um, on the ground by state-owned uh, state enterprises is still dominated by uh, fossil fuels, by uh, oil, gas, and petrochemical. The only um, difference there, and, and it's you know, much smaller, is uh, private enterprises um, who are you know, following the money and, and starting to invest in, uh, in renewables, which is interesting in itself. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it 
um, there and, and pass over to Darren, but I hope that gives a sense of the, the kinds of models that, that China might be able to explore um, in its own, um, its own development for its um, foray into South-South cooperation and climate finance. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <coughs> Save up those questions. Quite figured out what I deserve to uh, what I did to deserve this kind of introduction, but I will I will say that no. I'm thrilled to be back here being ribbed by my old friend and, and colleague Jennifer Turner. And well, he's like he's friends. like one of my I already have four brothers, but he's my fifth, so Aww. I have to rib him. Oh God, don't. <laughs> um, uh, and, and 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 new friends uh, Courtney and and Sam. Thanks for coming uh, early on a whatever this is Tuesday morning in, in lovely D.C. and sitting in a windowless room with us. Um, I am not going to talk about Sam's presentation. I'm not going to push the self-destruct button here. Yeah, there's a button there that turns off the whole system that they could do, so. You could shut down the government. Uh, no, I shouldn't <laughs> say that. Uh, so, so I want to talk a little bit. Um, I, I've been studying large-scale hydropower in China, uh, southwestern China uh, particularly, for about uh, 20 years um, and have made a lot of damn jokes in that time and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, a lot of friends in the big hydro and, and, and water um, world, both here and in, in China. Um, and now I want to move a little bit southward into mainland Southeast Asia to talk about um, how the uh, renewable energy system there might be um, uh, approached um, with a slightly different model um, that doesn't necessarily revolve around uh, seeing nails everywhere and hitting them with the hydropower hammer. Um, there are a lot of other uh, potential options for renewable energy development in Southeast Asia that don't uh, necessarily, th mainland Southeast Asia, that don't necessarily threaten um, in the same way uh, the fisheries uh, and rice production that are so crucially uh, linked to the Mekong River. Um, so uh, the, um, the first, I guess I'll say f at, at the start, and both Sam and Courtney um, referenced this in their own uh, presentations, um, there's a severe lack of coordinated planning um, in, in terms of energy, uh, both construction and operation. Uh, these are things that I've been <coughs> noticing in my work in China over the past couple of decades, um, and, and I, I, it seems to be the same in mainland Southeast uh, Asia, in that projects are, are really built and developed on a project-by-project on a, on a project basis with limited consideration of how it fits into the, the bigger picture, especially in terms of impacts. Uh, and this is, uh, again, especially true for, for hydropower. Um, we have done a lot of work on dams individually and, and, and understanding their impacts, but we have a long way to go in understanding, appreciating, uh, and, and mitigating the impacts of multiple um, dams in, in, uh, in the same watershed. Uh, so throughout, uh, what I, I mean, this is basically a tail wagging the dog kind of kind of system, right? Where the energy planning, energy companies, energy developers, Chinese or otherwise, uh, are leading the development path um, for rivers that have um, many more uses than than just energy sources, right? They're vital for food production, both fish and, and uh, rice, um, for transportation, et cetera, et cetera, for environmental flows. Um, shouldn't forget those. Um, the second point I'll start with is that energy efficiency, and uh, particularly energy uh, electrical efficiency at the end use, has to be a part uh, of electricity planning um, from from the start. Because uh, if the solution is 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 by by definition to build more supply without first addressing how much of that supply is inefficiently used in the transmission and, and the and the end use, uh, whether in lighting uh, or in um, uh, in factories uh, with, with uh, pumps that are moving liquids and, and, and that sort of thing, uh, running conveyor belts, um, the, the, uh, uh, the savings that can accrue from making minor changes at the end of the line and in use um, have a 50 to 80-fold multiplier effect back at the generation end of things. And I can say a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, and then finally, uh, that throughout uh, mainland Southeast Asia, especially in Cambodia, there's a lot there, as again, both of my um, colleagues have, have uh, hinted at, there's a lot of room for both grid-tied and off-grid uh, systems um, building on, on solar, uh, rich solar resource, particularly in Cambodia. So let me see where I'm looking. Okay, so 
If we, if we start with the assumption that the Mekong uh, region has something of an electricity problem, uh, I, I would point uh, specifically to Cambodia, whose grid was um, largely destroyed during the Vietnam War and has uh, still has, uh, I don't know, maybe a couple of dozen uh, small, interconnect, uh, small, small grids that uh, are, are not very well interconnected. That's improving rapidly, um, but there's still a very large percentage of uh, uh, Cambodia's population, especially in rural areas, that does not have access to electricity on a reliable basis. Even in urban areas in the major cities, um, that, that electricity can be reliable for part of the day and not, uh, not so much uh, uh, all day long. Uh, so this chart, I've got a couple of um, uh, figures showing both uh, urban, uh, overall, sorry, overall access. The uh, red at the top is Laos. Um, so with the highest rates of access, this only goes up to 2015 or 2016. I can't quite. 2016, um, and then the lower lower figures are uh, Cambodia's uh, numbers. With um, again, Cambodia's rural population being much lower. It's a few years out of date. Um, the numbers are apparently much higher right now as of January 2019, um, but still a lot of people without reliable access to electricity. Uh, at the same time, downstream electricity use among those who have it uh, is growing and uh, by most estimates is growing faster than uh, production, right, than generation rates. Um, the one outlier in this uh, chart, this country by country chart, is of course Yunnan province, which is not a country, but is country sized, uh, the size of Germany, <coughs> roughly uh, 40 million people, um, and has incredible hydroelectric assets, um, tall mountains uh, and, and steep rivers with lots of volume. Uh, most of which, or many of which, are already built out. Um, and as the blue uh, bar there, uh, the far left suggests or shows, um, the production coming out of that uh, power grid versus the consumption within Yunnan uh, is far greater. So there's a there's a there's a situation of electricity surplus um, that, in in my mind, um, colleagues ten years ago in China were predicting this in the, in the Southwest, um, twelve years ago, uh, and in my mind is not going to go away anytime soon. In Cambodia, meanwhile, this is a couple of pie charts showing uh, 2011 and 2015 electricity generation. The data are maybe, maybe you know, the exact percentages are, are, are not accurate uh, with what today, uh, with what today's numbers are. Um, but the the trend is important, and that is uh, in 2011, a lot of the electricity I mentioned those ice, uh, isolated micro grids uh, um, that, that were powered largely by diesel generation or fuel, heavy fuel oil generation. So extremely inefficient, uh, highly uh, polluting in terms of particulate matter, um, and uh, of course expensive. So Cambodia has the, the unenvi unenviable position of being uh, a country with very unreliable and, and relatively low electricity availability and yet high prices. Um, that situation got uh, a lot better, has gotten a lot better in, the, in, in recent years with a lot of the, um, the oil uh, generation being replaced by hydro. The hydro number is probably more than 50% now. Um, and the, uh, but but uh, uh, at the same time, coal has been built. Uh, so there's about 600 megawatts of installed capacity, which is tiny. Cambodia is a tiny country compared to uh, even its, its, its uh, Southeast Asian uh, neighbors, to say nothing of China. Um, but that coal capacity is, is relatively new. Um, and has uh, has basically displaced the production of um, uh, of electricity from from liquid dead dinosaurs in the form of fossil uh, petroleum and and, and uh, fuel oil um, to uh, to to coal. Can you can you go back that slide and just because the print's small? Can you tell them which is the coal, hydro, and oil? I don't think they could see it from far away, like on the. No, no. sure I can. <laughs> sure, <laughs> dish a little bit. He's back. like my brother. Right? <laughs> um, so so the big one on the left is the reddish is coal. Uh, the maroon red, yeah, bright red for you. Um, and I'm sorry, the, the red is oil. Uh, and uh, hydro uh, was supposed to be blue. It's now light, uh, lightish gray, and the darker gray is coal. <coughs> I aimed for blue for hydro. I don't know how that happened. You so need a microphone if you can ask a question. Grab the microphone. That's okay. I saw that it's important. Joke. You know, if you're going to have pie, we got to know what kind of pie it is. It's uh, it's 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 cherry pie. <coughs> Go back to the pie, baby. Killing me with the pie. Great. Sam, would you do your uh, wrap? Now? And just to say that the uh, this is Brian Eiler from the Stimson Center. In 2015, the the capacity of that 2015 generation mix was about 3,000 megawatts. So it's not a lot. 
mm. um, here. Mm. So adding anything into that pie is going to really shift right. the portions around. Right. So when you add, have small additions like 600 megawatts, a fifth of that, right, really changes the proportion. Thanks. I'll just note that the lower Saison 2 dam is basically that 400 that megawatt hydro, hydro that, yep. that shifted the percentages there. Great. Thanks. So it's basically the wild west of energy development. Right, so but a tiny wild west. It's, it's really staggering compared west. to the, I mean, the, you know, <coughs> on, on the upper Mekong in China where I've done most of my research, on the upper Salween, the, you know, the smallest dams in those cascades are, are, are four to 700 megawatts, right? And the largest ones are 4,000, 5,000, 7,000 uh, megawatts. Um, so radically different energy landscape, I guess, than, than what I've been the way I'm most used to seeing. So as I mentioned um, a, a while ago, the solution by Chinese energy developers, uh, who for 20 years now have been strongly encouraged to to go out, right, to, to go westward and to go out to seek projects. Um, long before Belt and Road was a thing, <laughs> there was Shibu Da Kaifa, develop the West. There was, there was, uh, there were all these policies such as uh, Yun Dian Dong Song, right? Uh, send Yunnan electricity eastward, and <laughs> all sorts of slow ko hao, right? And slogans like that, <coughs> that really pushed um, energy develop uh, energy developers into southwestern China, which had long been sort of off limits, uh, attractive from resources uh, perspective, but um, not so attractive from infrastructure pers from an infrastructure perspective. Both getting there, uh, roads and such, um, but also the transmission lines um, far away from load centers. Uh, so the, that has changed in the past couple of decades. There is a large scale build out uh, in the Southwest. Um, and just, just to give you a couple of, um, of ideas, that the map on, on top shows potential hydropower sites um, throughout the Mekong uh, drainage. Um, my colleagues at Stimson have some much greater, more detailed, uh, some maps with much greater detail on uh, just how densely dammed that region could be. Um, and I would argue, and I think most here would uh, agree, and most of my presenting colleagues would agree, that that would, would mean the death of one of the most rich, uh, the richest, is, richest and most important uh, fisheries um, in, in the world. So I mentioned a minute ago that uh, southwestern China's Yunnan province, roughly the size of Germany, has Roughly a quarter, maybe a fifth of the the Mekong um, length main stem in uh, in the provincial boundaries, um, and 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 alone that one province has more hydro than Russia, Norway, India, or Switzerland. Right, big hydro countries, big big countries, except well, a couple of them at least. Um, uh, just to just to give you an idea of the scale of development that has already occurred um, in 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 that area. Uh, manifested from 2000 to 2014 an 800% growth in the, um, in the hydro sector. Uh, and if you look at the pie chart on the right, I like pie. Um, <laughs> this one's blueberry, at least on my screen. Um, the pie chart on the right, you know, three, three quarters of the electricity uh, capacity installed in Yunnan um, uh, alone is hydro, right? Small and large. And again, small here goes down to 50 megawatts. Um, so 50 megawatts by most measures around the world is huge. <laughs> um, but in China, that's considered small. So dams, large and small, have a mixed record. Uh, I've done a lot of work on, on this subject uh, with, with colleagues. Um, and they have uh, clear benefits, as was demonstrated with the Three Gorges project uh, shortly after it was completed, in flood control, right? They can be very important in watersheds that are degrade, have degraded natural flood control capacity from wetlands that have been paved and that sort of thing. Um, they can provide uh, flood control. Um, local officials believe in the bottom of the heart um, uh, that, that, that uh, dams are uh, key to poverty alleviation oftentimes. Um, and uh, hydro in, in particular in a, in a heavy renewables context, so with lots of wind and solar, hydro has an almost unparalleled um, ability, except for chemical storage, to, to, to fill the gaps when, hydro, uh, when um, wind or solar output drops. Uh, hydro's ramp rate is really fast compared to that of thermal assets. Um, and so we have that, that, that need can be met with conventional hydro operated to follow uh, dips uh, in the load, um, but also with pump storage. And China has relatively little pump storage. Um, the problem, and this is especially acute in, in southern sort of monsoon susceptible areas of Southeast Asia and, and, and southern China, is that you can't maximize for flood control and uh, hydropower production at the same time. You can either do one or the other well, uh, or do each of them sort of halfway. 
um, just because they require holding or releasing water. A quick, quick story about the picture on the left. Um, this, this is all about uh, sort of negative impacts. One of the biggest impacts, of course, is, is the resettlement picture, right? And, and individuals who are resettled um, uh, in the tens of thousands up to the, the sort of worst case scenario, 1.3 million or so from Three Gorges, uh, resettled often from areas with uh, relatively scarce farmland into other areas with relatively scarce farmland where they may speak different languages, uh, have different agricultural customs, et cetera, et cetera. So integration into those new areas is difficult in many ways. Um, in the picture on the left of this slide, uh, the woman who's shaking her fist at me was not mad at me, uh, but was <laughs> mad at the dam company. This is in the, uh, near the site of Da Shan Dam, uh, the second dam on the upper Mekong and the Lansang in Yunnan. And the compensation estimates had been done uh, about 10 years prior to the dam actually being built. And so her children were young and, 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 and were, sort of were, con were considered as part of the household at that time. And those estimates were, were dished out, doled out by, by household. And by the time the dam was completed and the, um, the payments were actually made, her son, of course, was uh, 20 or so and didn't get any, any, any um, compensation for his own uh, home, and so she was, she was mad that that had taken so long and was done so poorly. There's some evidence um, that, that the situation has gotten better um, in China, um, but it, is, it remains a, a tough nut, well, uh, a tough nut to crack, um, uh, and word from, from Southeast Asia is that it's not necessarily much better there in terms of compensation for resettled uh, populations. Um, I mentioned a minute ago that while we understand the impacts of individual dams and uh, from socioeconomic, biophysical, geopolitical perspectives fairly well, um, it doesn't mean they're easy to measure, but we understand them fairly well, uh, the impact, the cumulative impacts of dams built in a cascade system are really, really, really poorly understood and hard to model um, without very large uh, error bars. Um, got a lot of colleagues a lot smarter than I am who, who uh, have done interesting work on that, um, but the, the degrees of freedom, basically, uh, that, that, uh, that arise in a complex situation such as a 4,800 kilometer long watershed like the Mekong with hundreds of tributaries uh, really make such uh, modeling um, difficult. The institutions throughout the region are, are, are numerous. Uh, most people know the Mekong River Commission with all its flaws and warts. Um, there are lots of, lots of other institutions that are popping up, U.S. government-led, Chinese government-led, et cetera, um, and they, they have all their weaknesses um, uh, and, and, again, contribute to the situation where there's not a lot of comprehensive planning. I'm going to skip through the snapshot of negative impacts fairly quickly. There are lots of them. We know most of them, um, uh, but some of them that are, are more acute, I would argue, in this system, such as sediment transport. The Chinese government is very reluctant to release data, um, daily flow data on the river, sediment transport data on the river, which only leaves downstream countries to suspect that the, that the situation is worse than it actually, that, that, than it, you know, worse than the Chinese government or the energy companies claim, right? So it, when you have a system such as the Tonle Sap that is absolutely dependent on that annual flood pulse that brings sediment down from uh, the upper Mekong, swells the river, deposits all that sediment uh, around the Tonle Sap um, and provides natural free fertilizer, um, for the rice production there, um, uh, claims that the that the upstream dams can help control floods, <laughs> I kind of ring hollow to farmers who depend on those floods. Um, uh, socioeconomic, we can sort of model. Okay, there are x x villagers who were displaced, and each of them was farming x amount of land, and sort of do, do some rough. Uh, estimates of how much their incomes uh, will be affected by uh, being flooded out, uh, but to actually really understand those numbers, it, it takes a lot of on the on the ground uh, field work. In some work we've done before, we we um, with some colleagues uh, led by Desiree Tullis at Oregon State University and funded by the National Science Foundation, with some great Chinese colleagues, um, we identified 21 impacts in socioeconomic, biophysical, and geopolitical, all with indicators, some of them complex, um, that we could use to understand those impacts. We, we tend to measure the easy ones, right? We tend to measure dams, uh, the success stories of dams by uh, electricity installed capacity, actual electricity output, um, flood control benefits, reservoir storage in terms of cubic meters, et cetera, et cetera. Those are easy to measure, even to, even to estimate from satellite imagery um, for some of the reservoir data. Cambodia, the interesting story, gets lots of sun. It really has a lot of sun. And so with a relatively small population, relatively low uh, 
electricity consumption uh, right now, but as I mentioned, uh, like most of its Southeast Asian neighbors uh, growing, um, there's uh, a lot of potential for um, building out solar, both grid-tied and islanded systems uh, for rural residents. Um, and uh, in, in, in Cambodia. And just a quick back of the nap napkin calculation I did suggests that uh, a, a spot uh, roughly 1 15th, a spot, an area roughly 1 15th uh, the size of the Tonle Sap Lake in the dry season would have enough solar capacity, would provide enough solar capacity to meet all of Cambodia's electricity needs, right? So the com comparable uh, uh, image, I guess, for the United States would be Lake Ontario, a Lake Ontario of solar panels in South Texas, right? So Lake Ontario is big from where I live in upstate New York. In South Texas, eh, you know, a little solar farm, something to think about. So uh, what makes it more interesting in this context is that there's pot potentially a transboundary model in Northern Europe uh, that could take advantage of all of that existing hydropower that I've uh, talked about already in Yunnan. Um, and uh, basically firm uh, a largely solar uh, generation base in, in Cambodia. Um, it's not uh, a given, but uh, Denmark, Germany, and Norway have a really interesting interlinked grid system that is fully information and communications technology enabled, a smart grid. Every inch of grid that China is building these days is smart. Um, and uh, in that, in that three-country context in, in Northern Europe, uh, un uh, um, Norway's, uh, uh, Norway's hydro, Norway's electric sector is basically 95% hydro. Norway's hydro can uh, fill the dips, if you will, in the, in the solar or wind output from, from Germany and, and, um, and Denmark uh, within seconds. Um, and so a similar model, I would argue, might be useful in Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia with Yunnan and potentially some Lao hydro um, uh, playing that role. Um, there are challenges. It's not a given that this could happen, and ironically, the, challenge, the software challenges are probably the harder ones, right? The market piece, the wholesale market, uh, the auction pieces that, that, uh, that, that uh, Courtney referenced a while ago, how to enable different users of electricity um, who are tying into those assets to purchase uh, electricity um, at, at you know, different time intervals um, based on planned needs and actual real-time needs. Um, there is mistrust, regional historical mistrust that didn't arise yesterday isn't going to go away tomorrow, um, and uh, that would have to be that would have to be dealt with. A role for Lao, um, Lao sees hydro as a as a an economic development opportunity, and so a role for Lao. How how does Lao win in this situation? Um, the the uh, the, the potential is there, and like I said, it would require a lot of expertise and a lot of a lot of uh, capacity building. So. I'll conclude with a slide. Somebody said to me a long time ago um, that if we, if we, if that we tend to measure the easy things, uh, right? So I referenced a minute ago hydropower, and they said if we don't measure the things we value, we end up valuing the things we measure, right? And I think that is crucial to keep in mind in a watershed like the Mekong, where we have so many people who depend daily on that river for uh, food, um, food and livelihood and where we care about things like food security, biodiversity, geopolitical stability, but it's hard to put numbers on those, right, uh, compared to the easy numbers of hydroelectric capacity. Um, and so that we need to all think uh, critically and carefully and creatively um, about how state and non-state actors might best promote a grid um, that or an energy development scenario that uh, sustains those livelihoods and those, those, those priorities aside from electricity. All right. Thanks. Sounds good. All right. Can you give me the clicker? All right, um, I'm just going to ask one or two questions, and then you all are going to leap into action. And if they don't like my questions, they may turn to you and say, we don't want her questions. But one, one of my first questions is, um, I mean, let, let's just focus on the, the solar. First of all, from Sam, I'd like to hear about, because you skipped over a slide, I was you, about mm -hmm. opposition within China on those small rural solar plants. Mm -hmm. Can you tell Maybe us a little bit? Mm. There no, there, there was. Um, so b that was... Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You can get Talking. a picture. That was specifically. Uh, no, you just passed it. Did I please roll yeah, right go through it? Forward. There okay. we go. So um, that's me and, and, and the researcher talking to a herder about that PV plant, which I had um, shown a picture of. Yeah. Um, the opposition there was really about the, 
the model and the and the lack of local buy-in and it's a um, you know it, as I mentioned this was a uh, this is now a national policy that was rolled out as a series of pilots and this was one pilot and I would and I imagine it was one of the one of the um, uh, worst implemented or I don't know if it was the worst version of 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 the model but it certainly wasn't one of the better ones and because I, I mean I know from reading other studies and there have been a couple of reviews of the policy implementation um, in, in the academic literature. And for example, in Anhui and in some other places, it, it, it was done in a way where you actually did have, you know, um, local um, uh, rural households, rooftop solar being, uh, being uh, rolled out and, um, and uh, more uh, workable financial vehicles and so on that meant that local householders were able to um, get those up and running and sell the excess electricity back to the grid and so on. In this case, local herders had no stake in this particular project. They knew nothing about the, um, the financing of it, the fact that they were supposed to be benefiting financially from, uh, from, from a, a fund or whatever that had been created from this, apparently. Um, and yeah, talking to people, they had very mixed views about on-grid solar. Generally, everyone used off-grid solar and found it a very workable mm -hmm. um, and and very kind of um, you know it, it, it clearly already aligned with um, uh, people's energy practices in their in their daily lives effectively. So it sounds like um, that some of these projects they they didn't do like a like a an assess you know didn't talk to the local people and and figure out what their actual needs were because I thought it was kind of I mean seriously people solar bu butter churns yeah I mean, well, well that that that's that was, awesome. uh, that's kind of the, the the point of the very complex diagram about the the flows of authority as well this was a policy that was largely designed by energy regulators rather than uh, poverty alleviation experts had there been more um, uh, integration with the local poverty alleviation offices I would hope hope that there, there might have been greater kind of development knowledge that would have been integrated at that stage. Yeah, as it happens, most people had, were kind of ambivalent about this, um, uh, this utility grade plant that had been built because they, um, it hadn't, taken, hadn't directly taken any land for um, uh, grazing because it um, was actually, um, it had been farmland belonging to another um, Han Chinese uh, village and so there was, no, there was no particular concern there. But there was a general sense that this was part of the um, the building out of the um, the uh, east-west energy corridor, mm -hmm. and that this was electricity that was being built largely for export to um, you know more affluent eastern seaboard provinces, um, and that you know essentially this was um, uh, this was thinking of um, land as I suppose a th uh, or th this land as a sort of thoroughfare for um, uh, for energy and and as a resource for. Um, um, uh, renewable energy extraction, um, <laughs> rather than, you know, a sense that actually the, this is, these are productive landscapes with, you know, an interaction of animals and humans and, and you know, all kinds of uh, economic activity. Um, you know, mo mobile pastoralism is a, is a you know, it's a, it's a viable economic world there that exists. And, um, and, and there are all kinds of energy practices in daily life that are, that, you know, caught up with it. But, the, this, this, these large like pylons are sort of just um, essentially breaking through that landscape, mm -hmm. um, and that's of course part of State Grid's larger plan, which is the um, uh, use of ultra high voltage transmission lines to transmit um, energy, both fossil and renewable, from the northwest through to the um, uh, to the east. So what we found, I guess, was that actually we were looking at a landscape that was sort of not is not really thought of as as somewhere where energy is consumed. It's really thought of as somewhere that it's either extracted or just passes through. Um, which, which actually fits into the whole, I mean, China's Shibu development Hake. model. You sure. know, Shibu yeah. that guy. Yeah, but so much. now maybe for you two, just thinking now now thinking of his example. And again, I, we don't want to just dwell on the fact there has there have been successful examples where rural communities have truly benefited in China. But but think about Sam's model. I mean, can you see what some of the, there may be some obstacles. Like, I mean, think about Cambodia, like this kind of more rural solar. Do you, do you see some obstacles to that? There's big potential? Or do you think in, in Southeast Asia that it should be, do we need to go solar farms? I mean, I, I think. With the BRI. Frankly, I think both are, are really necessary and would be valuable for instance, getting at Cambodia and Myanmar's 
lack of electricity access, particularly in rural areas, um, building out grids is going to take a long time and it's going to have great impact. So when you're looking at rural communities, particularly ethnic minorities that live in the upland areas, in many cases, particularly in the short term, building small scale household solar is going to be a better investment than trying to build out centralized transmission lines to connect to the grid. Financially, there I don't know that there have been that many studies in Cambodia per se, but there have been some small-scale studies in, I think, Myanmar that would be applicable that really show this. The, ch the challenge is getting policymakers to agree to that because policymakers, at least in Cambodia, still take a fairly centralized view of this. They want there to be a, na a national energy grid. They want people to be connected. In many cases, there are other policy motivations um, behind connecting these villages to the grid and sort of integrating people more broadly into the national economy. So from a financial and sustainability standpoint, it might make sense, but it's not always clear how that aligns with the national motivations for development. Okay. What do you I'll got just, for me? Uh, I got, I'll take your um, uh, uh, solar churn butter and raise it <laughs> by a solar churn fermented mare's milk in, uh, in, in Mongolia. So there's another interesting nomadic herder um, population uh, for whom it doesn't make uh, a lot of sense to have a centralized ultra high voltage DC grid built out over a vast expanse of very sparsely populated country uh, where much of the population is 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 moving uh, for for, uh, for part of the year um, and so there's been a lot of innovation in uh, Mongolia uh, outside of UB and, and the other uh, big cities um, such as they are to uh, bring solar and storage and so uh, and DC appliances, including uh, one that a colleague uh, dug up, um, uh, which was a fermented mare's milk churner. So it could be a global market for uh, that. I, they, prob <laughs> probably so. I will also say that I mean I think uh, Courtney kind of alluded to this. I think there's um, there's room for for an all of the above in in solar in that uh, a lot of that that uh, rural population that's not served by electricity right now. Um, could it have at least some of their needs met um, by uh, off-grid systems um, where, where uh, whereas uh, the municipalities and the, the larger load centers um, could have that uh, electricity provision coming from largely non-carbon sources. Um, changing the, the one, well, not the one, one of the many pieces that would have to be worked out is that operating hydro on a load-following basis versus a base load basis will have um, implications in terms of bank erosion and, and flood pulses downstream um, that would have to be uh, addressed. Um, but again, sort of given the, the, the degree of the build out that has already occurred in Yunnan and that is underway uh, right now, there's such potential for having a system like this that, um, that, that, that uh, could avoid a lot of carbon-based energy. All right. Very exciting. Let's open up. I get my my Jill and Josh Chow are out there. We got to thank them for all their help setting us up today. And so when you when you ask your questions, say who you are. Try to keep your questions succinct. We have a fair amount of time, but we got for those of you who knew the China Environment Forum, audiences are never shy with questions. So, okay, go ahead. Hi, Ryan Hober with UN Foundation. Uh, two questions for s both Sam and Courtney. One is there was a lot of focus on greening at the recent BRI forum. Uh, what came of that? Is that serious? Uh, do you see uh, there's been a lot of rhetoric around that for a long time? Is you know where does that stand? And the other is I was struck by um, maybe Courtney something you said about demand from countries about uh, what kinds of energy they want. Is there an opportunity to encourage certain Southeast Asian countries? to somehow either through incentives or politics or some other way um, encourage them to uh, demand cleaner, greener energy from, from BRI in particular? Do you want to start? Okay. Uh, sure. Sorry. Yeah, I can take a take a first step. So regarding the, the question about sort of greening the BRI and the rhetoric surrounding that, I think ultimately the big the biggest answer and the most clear answer to that question is the type of projects that the BRI funds. So, you know, China can do, a, a, has done a lot of talk about its investments in, in climate consider, you know, its investments in renewable energy technologies, its consideration of climate, its goal to be an ecological civilization, and domestically a lot of that is playing out. But when you look at the type of projects that BRI has funded to date, most of them are in fossil fuels. 
most of that money is going towards towards non-carbon fr- friendly technologies. Um, if that starts to shift and we see the investments coming out in 2019 and 2020 really changing tack, I think from my perspective, that would be a sign that the Belt and Road truly is greening. I think there's a lot of momentum that's very difficult to overcome because a lot of the investments in hydropower and in fossil fuels are essentially taking over capacity inside China and shifting that abroad. There's a lot of investment in those sectors. It's going to be very difficult to make that fast transition. Um, that, that said, I do think there's an opportunity for, for China, United States, and other development partners and investors to really encourage Southeast Asia to shift their energy focus. Um, one aspect of that, frankly, is the regulatory issue. Most of the policymakers that are planning energy in Southeast Asian countries are trained in older technologies. They were trained in fossil fuels. They were trained in hydropower, particularly for the Mekong countries. They're familiar with it. They know how to operate a grid with these baseload technologies. Making a shift to even operating hydropower in a peaking manner, for instance, requires training. Making a shift to to show that it is feasible for these countries to integrate renewable energy at a significant percentage of their supply without causing disruption to the system, they need to see case studies. They need to have technical training in this. And in many cases, they need to update the policies surrounding the regulatory framework. So for instance, Cambodia is a good example of this. There's been significant investor interest in solar in Cambodia for years because Cambodia has one of the highest prices per kilowatt of electricity for ASEAN. Um, in rural areas where people are using imported diesel for for like mini grid or household use, it often is above $1 per kilowatt hour because of the cost of importing the diesel. In rural areas, it's only recently dropped under 20 cents per kilowatt hour as additional power supply came online. So for Cambodia, businesses themselves often wanted to invest in warehouse or building level rooftop solar to help defray some of those costs because it's cheaper than buying from the grid. And for a long time, Electricity du Cambodge, the the utility company, has essentially not allowed for any grid-connected household or company to also invest in solar and manage that. They'd have to be on an entirely separate system. And a lot of that was due to those concerns about stability. So both showing technical case studies that this is feasible, doing studies and working with electricity utilities and electricity planners in Cambodia and other countries in the region to show it's not going to disrupt their system. It's actually an economic benefit to integrate more renewable energy. And showing that the investor interest is there and ready to go when those policies change is the biggest way to make to make these shifts happen in the near term. And Cambodia has slowly seen this shift. Um, there's, I, I don't know if anyone here has been following this, but um, drought this year has caused rolling blackouts in Cambodia, including to government buildings, where for six hours at a time, they, they closed down portions of the city. And that's largely because such a significant portion of the electricity supply comes from hydropower and it's the end of the dry season or getting towards the end of the dry season. If they had invested in solar earlier instead of just a few very small pilot projects, if they had robustly integrated even 10% of the energy supply coming from solar, that would likely have significantly uh, reduced the, the, the vulnerability to drought. And that type of concern, plus the investor interest that's been rolling in in the last couple years for solar projects, is likely going to lead to a shift in the energy mix in the future. The question is just how quickly that happens. Well, I'm reminded one of your first slides, you talked about what the region needs is macro, big planning, big thinking, you know, because you got to fit all the, it's a lot of moving parts, but what was it, you know, They've got the hydro, they've got the coal and the hydropower hammer. Mm. That's, that's the solution that comes down. Want to note that for those of you on the webcast, if you can tweet at Wilson CEF, you too can ask questions <coughs> to torture my speakers. Other questions? I, 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 oh, I, I was going to fo- follow up on the sure. on the Belt and Road Forum question. So, so the, I mean, just to add on, in terms of what's actually come out of this recent forum, there is definitely more sort of green rhetoric in the recent forum than in previous ones. Xi Jinping said that the Belt and Road would be green and sustainable. Um, and and there's a number of kind of new initiatives, but there's, a, there's I think, big questions still about the implementation, about the actual how of this, um, you know, how, how are these uh, projects going to, going to be insured, you know, what sort of principles are actually going to be implemented in terms of ensuring that uh, projects are sustainable. Um, there was the launching of something called the BRI Green Development Coalition, 
um, led by the uh, Ministry of Environment and Ecology um, that's supposed to uh, bring together a series of kind of policy dialogues, um, NGOs, think tanks, business actors, biannual policy dialogues on greening the BRI, series of kind of work streams there. There was the launch of green investment principles, um, and you know there has been quite a lot of work, you know, being done. And I do think this is where some of the more progressive, interesting kind of greening BRI policy is happening, um, is uh, in the China Banking Regulatory Commission, um, in the Green Finance Committee, that the former um, uh, People's Bank of China Green Finance Chief uh, sort of set up. There was uh, there was an announcement of some principles that the China Development Bank. I think we're signing on to. So there's been, a, you know, th th there's a number of um, uh, signals around constraining lending. I think an understanding there that uh, investing in fossil fuels is risky. You know, an understanding by the uh, financial community and banking regulators in China that investing in, uh, a, you know, an outdated technology that will uh, become increasingly expensive as uh, as the cost of renewables continues to fall, as externalities are taken into account as carbon pricing comes in uh, around the world is is a risky prospect and i do think there's i think there's some understanding of that in uh you know among financiers and that that's starting to kind of uh come about in the rhetoric there's also the launch of something called the belt and road energy partnership which is mainly among yeah. uh, energy producer countries but as, uh, as as courtney said you've also got to look at the outcomes in terms of deals and there was a whole series of of deals signed on the sidelines of this including um, road mining, power sector projects in Cambodia, Kazakhstan, Turkey, um, a new um, coal-fired power plant in Indonesia, um, uh, investments in Pakistan's um, uh, coal fields, uh, lignite mining projects in the Thar Desert. You know, at the same time as they're building the largest uh, <coughs> solar plant in the world in Pakistan. So you know, you've got these things that are, are kind of happening simultaneously. But but there's certainly the uh, export of overcapacity in. Uh, in, in coal, the export of, of, of capital uh, into uh, coal-fired generation, Chinese technology flowing into, uh, in, into, into coal production and, um, and coal-fired generation around the world. And it's, uh, you know, uh, I extremely critical. And, and I mean, uh, if it goes ahead as planned, we'll uh, undoubtedly break Paris targets. Hu Tao, tell us who you are. Yeah, Hu Tao from Peace. Professional Association for China's Environment. So uh, I'd like to thanks first to thanks our uh, presenters for the excellent presentations. I'd like to join you to following uh, discussing the solar energy poverty alleviation obstacles. I found that beside this uh, regulatory framework, I found two technological obstacles. One is early, uh, Darren mentioned the energy storage system. Without an energy store or without a cheap energy store, affordable energy storage system is so hard for the herders, especially the off-grid ones, you know, to use the solar system in the night, to use uh, uh, wind turbines without wind. So this is one. Uh, another one is high efficient uh, solar energy generators. You probably heard the the Hanergy, not energy, the Hanneng, the company. Mm. They have uh, developed the plastic film kind of energy system. That's a dramatic improve the efficiency. So for your information, actually, my work right now is uh, working together with uh, uh, energy storage company, doing a demonstration in China, and in, uh, working together with Thailand Minister of Energy uh, on uh, off-grid energy storage demonstration in Bangkok. Mm. We can talk later uh, after the meeting. My uh, quick question to you, Darren. Uh, obviously, for the large dams, there are negative impacts. My question to you is, what are the alternatives? Is the small dams better as an alternative, or we have to find some other ways? Yeah. Thank you very much. That's a great question, and and many times uh, when I was in China doing uh, when I'm in China doing research and talking to people in the uh, hydro, in the dam world, oftentimes I, I, the, the first uh, few minutes of the conversation uh, goes something like this: "You're you're anti dam, aren't you?" And uh, and my my maybe my comeback, maybe my cop out is not I'm, I'm against bad dams. 
Um, and and the, so I, my, my argument would be um, absolutely every dam has impacts, right? We have to, every energy uh, source has, has negative impacts, right? There's been a lot of research that's very troubling on the life cycle impacts of solar uh, PV, for instance, um, especially when there's not responsible um, care taken with the byproducts of manufacturing those solar panels. Um, the uh, question of whether, so 20, roughly 20 years ago, World Commission on Dams published its, its, uh, you know, its dams report, right? And it was a damming report of the dam industry. Um, I'm not trying to make puns there. They're just happening. They, uh, d you know, they said, look, uh, the costs, the installation costs are always higher. The environmental costs are always higher. The, uh, the, the, the electricity is always more expensive than it was produced, et cetera, et cetera. It's plenty of areas for corruption. These are long-term projects. A lot of people can slip a little bit into their pocket as they go. Um, and so for a little while in the early 2000s, there was kind of a, 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 a mantra that small was better. Small was beautiful. And then a couple of uh, close colleagues, uh, Kelly Kibler and um, Desiree Tullis, uh, did a study in, I want to say it was published in 2003, uh, 13, sorry, um, uh, on the cumulative impacts of lots of small dams on primarily in terms of habitat fragmentation, both fragmentation of the riparian habitat um, and you know, alongside the river and the aquatic habitat. Right? So it's not just about fish, but also about creatures that move alongside the river um, on, on, on land uh, and about forest habitat, et cetera, et cetera. Right? That those showing very clearly that uh, in certain conditions, such as uh, warmer climates in, in southeast, mainland Southeast Asia, southern China that we're looking at, um, the cumulative impacts of uh, a lot of small dams can indeed be greater. Uh, not to mention questions of oversight, right, uh, care in, in, in conducting the EIA, the environmental impact assessments and such, in the first place. Um, so, so I guess I would, I would argue, when, when I, um, thanks to my Stimson colleagues a couple years ago, we had a conversation a meeting in Kunming um, that uh, engaged some uh, Chinese uh, decision makers in the hydro sector. And there's is such an ingrained belief among many of the, the, the dam building community um, that the impacts can be engineered away and that they can be studied in the abstract and can be engineered away. And I guess I always, maybe this is my geographer training, um, I always come back to the, to the point that place matters, right? Context, that, that specific context of the Mekong River Basin matters so much. Um, and, 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 and that building out uh, a bunch of smaller tributary dams um, could have a tremendously negative impact uh, on the health of the, of the, of the ecosystem. Um, so is that, is that your, did I answer your question? Yeah. I think so, okay. Micro. micro, yeah. So micro, micro is cute. Um, no, mi micro uh, also has a role. It can be. I mean, all of them can be done well or can be done poorly, right? And I would just say that there, there are examples of micro hydropower in um, uh, in in uh, in China, uh, in the United States, that completely dewater stretches of the river, right? During especially when you have river uh, streams whose flows vary seasonally. Um, you can have a situation where uh, there is no water in a stretch of the river because that, that water has been diverted through a channel, through, a, through a, um, uh, a, a, a diversion tube, dropped through a penstock into the generator a kilometer or two down the, um, down, down the river. Um, and so for that stretch of river, uh, there's rocks, right? Fish have a hard time living there. Um, so it get, you know, if you, I guess, uh, planning uh, these, these installations from, from, from micro to uh, gigantic, um, uh, you know, from kilowatt scale to gigawatt scale, um, requires uh, a real attention to the, to the costs, even those that are hard to measure, right? Not, uh, not a, a planning process that is led by the developers who want to, to develop just for development's sake and who cut and paste impacts from EIAs in, in radically different contexts to say, ah, oh, you know, roughly no imp negative impacts. Yeah, and I'd just like to have a quick two finger on what Darren said. And one of the big challenges, which he alluded to earlier, and which we've done a lot of work on at the Stimson Center, is the challenge with the project by project approach. 
when you're looking at hydropower projects, particularly in the lower Mekong, it's often different developers having different projects on the same tributary system. There's not necessarily coordination. And ultimately, there's not the prioritization of projects based on impact because the developers and the developer interest in building these projects is so fundamental in pushing projects forward. When you look particularly at Laos and Cambodia, which collectively have more than 140 planned dams in the Mekong system, um, they don't have the financial capacity to build these projects themselves. They rely on outside investment. And so the projects that make the most sense from an outside investor point of view, and which often have externalities, the cost of which are going to be borne by the countries and not by the developers, so that's not taken into account at all. Um, they, they go for individual projects that make the most sense at one point in time. They don't look at sort of a cascade planning perspective. And they also, at the national planning level, often don't fully consider alternatives. So for instance, within that 140 dam scenario for the Mekong, there are many different scenarios of which dams would be built. Um, some of those scenarios will have significantly fewer impacts than others, particularly if you also consider the alternative options like integration of solar or wind as a complement to dry season hydropower production, um, natural gas as an alternative to coal, um, energy trade as an alternative to building out an, an overly excessive national capacity. These considerations are just not fully taken into account. So from a, a national or even regional perspective, system scale planning is a much better alternative to this project by project approach, which certainly doesn't prohibit <coughs> individual large or small dam projects, but we'll try to identify more optimal scenarios across a variety of different factors like relocation, biodiversity, fisheries, sediments, and the other concerns that national governments and local communities have. Can I say something on just solar quick. energy for yeah. poverty alleviation? Just on, on, on your point about um, the need for improvements in battery storage and in solar panels. I mean, I'd just briefly say that uh, you're right that Clearly, innovation in both fields is necessary, and I think China is putting in part of what's needed for those innovations. I would say that sort of essentially, you, um, uh, you know, technological systems benefit from both these like top-down, state, state-centric, um, uh, very managed uh, approaches to innovation, and from learning from demand successes and sort of bottom-up processes. And when it comes to solar, you can kind of, s and, and solar home systems more broadly, storage, batteries, you kind of see the need for both. I think China's got it right in terms of the, what they're doing to support the kind of, I, I mean, essentially any technological breakthrough comes through patient top-down state support. You know, that's the history of, of technological innovation has shown us that in, in the United States as much as in China. Um, and they're putting in the, the R&D support and so on for, you know, long term for the more advanced forms of solar, whether it's, yeah, dye sensitized panels or films or whatever, and with batteries as well. I think, you know, there, there will be new generations of battery storage, which will come through that kind of patient support that, you know, the medium long term plan and all these long term um, sort of industrial policy, innovation policy in China puts in. But at the same time, I think we can actually learn quite a lot from what's happening on the ground in terms of solar home systems as they're being installed in places like East Africa, say, where you know, you're actually getting enormous uptake very quickly of solar home systems. That means you know, battery paired with a, with a small um, solar panel. And, uh, and it's really transforming energy access um, in very reliable, cheap ways. And you know, what's interesting is the, I mean, the, the policy that's being designed by um, the private sector, NGOs, development agencies, but the technology is all Chinese. I mean, these are all, in, in a sense, China could be talking about themselves as the, as the protagonist of, this, of these development breakthroughs that are happening in East Africa. As it happens, they're not. I mean, we, t we, we hear about the large um, invested, you know, um, large scale top down invested projects that you know, China's investing in nuclear and in hydro and so on in East Africa. But actually, this is also, they're also a kind of undiscussed protagonist in the, in the build out of this uh, solar energy that's meeting the needs of the poor um, with the technology. But actually, the, the, the innovation there is in the business model and in the, the financial models and so on that are allowing people to, to, um, uh, to get el electricity access for the first time. So you have things like mobile banking being used for pay-as-you-go solar home systems. And, and, and it, all the components are already there, and they're just being sort of put together by actors on the ground. So there's actually there's a lot happening in the world of um, storage and storage solutions as they're already, um, uh, you know, as they're already applicable and appropriate. 
And you, I think you need both. You think that China could, I mean... I think China, China can learn, learn an enormous amount from what's happening uh, already, uh, sort of on the ground. Uh, often actually you know, utilizing Chinese technology, but in, um, you know, th there's, there's demand innovation, uh, sort of demand-led or user-led innovation, bottom-up innovation happening in China um, and, and more broadly. I mean, that's, that's true in the history of, of Chinese renewable energy as well. I mean, yeah. uh, if you look, uh, solar water heaters is, is, oh, a, yeah. is, the, is the classic example. They're absolutely ubiquitous mm -hmm. in China. They benefited from no state-centric policy. Yeah. It is Chinese indigenous innovation. They were designed in Tsinghua and then sort of rolled out. But there's no, uh, it's not IP intensive. There's no, there's no patents on this stuff, really. Um, it's just kind of local innovation that has, has, uh, has driven this stuff because it came in at a price point that was effective. It needed no grid integration. It met an immediate development need. And you know, anyone who's been to a Chinese village knows that everyone is using uh, solar water heaters. But having, it's had several, having had cold showers for a while, right? right. Early on in China, <laughs> the solar water heaters are awesome. Do they, are they sold overseas? Uh, rarely, yeah, they, and it's it's not it's not part of it, it's not say I mean they, they are on the there, there are markets f for it, but it's not part, for example, of China's South South Corporation on climate. And you think why? I mean, there's an immediate um, th these are uh, low carbon innovations that serve the needs of the poor. Mm. They could fit under these sorts of criteria, but they, as we've discussed, the sort of the the way I guess that energy planners think about mm. um, low carbon innovation think about energy needs is quite, uh, is, um, is quite shaped by a particular kind of very top-down mm -hmm. centralized grid model of, of uh, energy use, which doesn't necessarily fit with, say, what a development practitioner or a social researcher might find if they were actually to, to look at the way uh, the sorts of energy people use and, and want. So the BRI, you know, advocacy leadership folks in Beijing are missing a big opportunity to brag and to lead things on. But that's why we're here talking. So we have Brian Eiler, the author, just so you know, of the book, Last Days of the Mighty Mekong, if you want to get a really cool, I don't know, the best storytelling I've read about understanding the Mekong, what's happening, the development, and the energy stuff. So just, just a little plug there for you, buddy. Thank you, Jennifer. And I, I learned the storytelling um, opportunity, how that connects so well from, from you and what you do here at the Wilson Center. Um, just a, a quick two responses and a, and a brief question. Um, Microhydro uh, to Hu Tao. The insurance companies out there really hate microhydro, uh, particularly in the face of, of climate-induced um, weather events that can just come in and wipe out one of these smaller systems. Um, so the, the, sh the market has kind of shifted away from this, unfortunately, um, for better or for worse. Um, and then, Darren, you mentioned, and your slide shows that the um, hydro's fast ramp rate and ability to store renewable energy is its greatest asset, so that moving hydro from a base load uh, meeting technology and a peaking technology into that middle section that balances out the intermittency um, really is a, a grand opportunity for the future. And it's a way to actually keep um, more undammed rivers undammed by utilizing what is still, what is already built and rethinking how it's used. Um, and you mentioned the downstream ecological impacts because, you know, you're running water through dams at a very irregular rate. Right. Um, but if there's a cascade, if there's a downstream dam that can catch right. that, right. that that is coming down and, and say all the peoples have been resettled out of this unfortunately gutted out canyon um, and the ecological values there do not matter, then this is the zone for doing that. Right. Um, and again, at the at the benefit of saving long lengths of other, other rivers. Um, so moving to, to my question of what Sam had mentioned, um, you know, the question of why, why do this? Um, you know, China has... Uh, it is the, the so-called leader of the Paris Treaty, um, and really the only one out there that, that could be leading the charge. Um, can Is there a way to compel or implore a sense of, of, of responsibility uh, for China to assist developing countries with making a more climate-forward, emissions-reduced power system, um, like in Cambodia or like in Pakistan? Um, and in, when, when we talk to uh, Chinese counterparts about this idea, we often hear, oh, China doesn't do the capacity building. You know, we don't engage in the policy and capacity building about how to change a power sector, particularly, uh, because that's a, a form of interference. Mm. Uh, that's something that China doesn't do. We don't interfere. We don't intervene in other countries' affairs. Well, we can make it. But, um, and um, 
but rather we're, we invest, we build things. So how do you, how do you change the mind there that, that you, you know, given like the IPCC report that came out last fall, our window for opportunity for change here is, is very short. Um, and someone's going to pay the cost of all this. China will bear some of the costs eventually. We're going to bear some of the, the, the costs eventually. These countries are going to bear the greater costs um, if they can't make that transition. So how do you change minds to have a sense of responsibility in China for assisting for a more climate for a renewable energy transition in mm. the developing world? I'm really glad you got that question. <laughs> So, so, I mean, what I'll say is, I, I suppose the reason I wanted to start with that slide was to provoke a bit of thought about why is it that China and that Xi Jinping was, was willing to double down on this notion of Chinese climate leadership at that point, given that it didn't really need to. Um, as you say, China kind of by default becomes the climate leader with, with um, the US retreat from Paris. So why say it then? Well, because I think it aligns with a number of um, political and economic goals, technological leadership being a major one, China as the leading supplier of the technologies of the future to the world, the sort of uh, supplier and manager of um, infrastructures that, that power uh, the future, and has seen significant co-benefits already in um, technologies that can increase energy security through manufacturing. Essentially, that you by by not being reliant on um, you know uh, geopolitically entangled and volatile flows of fossil fuels, one can actually enhance uh, energy security and resilience by uh, essentially through learning curve effects and through um, the um, uh, price reductions in scaling um, uh, production of, of of renewables. And they've really strongly benefited, I think, economically and politically already by by that. Kind of long-term gamble, essentially, on the on a on a low-carbon transition, on a low-carbon future, and I'm I, I'm I'm fairly convinced that that's that those are the kind of drivers. Yes, of course, China, you know, the Chinese elite policy-making circles kind of get that there are significant costs to uh, climate change in terms of vulnerabilities in China. It's going to exacerbate drought in the north. It's going to exacerbate flooding in the south. You know, long-standing problems which uh, aren't going to go away. It's going to exacerbate food insecurity, which is you know number one policy priority every year. Um, it's uh, you know China's export-oriented growth model means it has very high urban concentrations in low co coastal elevation uh, zones, which are vulnerable to storm surges, to typhoons. You know, I think there's an understanding that China's exposed and that it uh, needs to play a role. But I think a much stronger reason to double down on this is. Um, the, uh, the, the, the intersection of kind of technological, industrial, innovation kinds of policies with uh, climate change mitigation. There's also a side benefit in sort of soft power, which is not insignificant, but I don't, again, I don't think it's as strong a, a, a driver as, as um, uh, economic and uh, sort of industrial innovation policy type uh, drivers. So with, you know, I guess, the invitation was sort of bearing that in mind. Why doesn't China benefit its most innovative industries um, and help them to to gain a foothold in developing Asia, where there is a where there is a need for, uh, for you know, uh, where, where there's a strong need for electricity access and infrastructure, um, rather than benefiting its uh, its failing industries? And at the moment, the BRI is largely a an escape valve for uh, overcapacity. Um, uh, for firms that have, uh, you know, ceased to, to, to have a, a market in China. Can, uh, can, yeah. yeah. I, no, I agree with that. Can I, can I jump in? One thing yeah. was interesting today when I went and I was looking at some of the government documents about the BRI, second BRI forum, and on one of the government web pages, they actually had a section talking about the NGO joint recommendations that came mm. out. There's a group called Belt and Road Green Development Partnership, Green Innovation Hub, China Dialogue. Global China, China Dialogue. I think you mentioned. But I want to I want to highlight that that they um, that they you know they have put forward some some eleven recommendations for specific measures on greening BRA investments. That's you know environmental and social risk. I'm sure you know Sutip from Vermont Law School. You'll be happy to note that there's of course also asking for better governance and transparency. And so, but the fact that that's in, I mean they're, they're, again it was the before the forum, but the fact that even the Chinese government is kind of letting these voices be heard. So 
And you know, it also is not noted that a lot of international NGOs, I mean, look at these guys up here, right? You know, Wilson Center World, a lot of people are looking at this topic. So I think that, that this, is why, this is why we're having this meeting to get people thinking even more and, and Stimson is constantly doing these kind of meetings. Um, speaking of which, let me insert that Michael Davidson from the Belfer Center, uh, to, we chat, uh, we chat, uh, text, yeah, not we chat, tweeted, 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 I'm on, I'm on we chat right now. Um, a question that he wanted, I think his, 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 uh, his Wi-Fi kind of went out a bit when Darren was talking, but he wanted to get a little bit more info from you, Darren, about the, the regional power pools in ASEAN to manage renewable energy intermittency. Okay. And I'm sure you had a few more juicy nuggets about, you know, how does, how does this, this, this cross-border transboundary stuff that's going to work? Sure, um, I can say a little bit about that. I first would like uh, to circle back very, very briefly to um, the comment Brian made uh, that I think is an important one about uh, changing how you operate hydro um, to be load following or, or, or peaking uh, plant. Um, and this, the, the, the idea of having it at the bottom of a cascade, the, the last dam in the cascade being a re-regulating dam, right, that sort of smooths out the bumps in, in that in the, those those pulses uh, that are there for um, from from the upstream dams. Um, sadly, the uh, the last dam in the um, in the Lanzhang Cascade, so the, the Yunnan stretch of the Mekong, um, uh, was supposed to be a re-regulating dam, right? And it was the only one that was canceled um, in that first in the first eight dams that was that, that were planned there. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, right at this one, I meant uh, right at the border uh, with Laos, um, and the so there's some recognition, I think, of the value of those of those types of dams for smoothing out the environmental, or, or at least trying to mimic, the, uh, the the natural hydrograph of the river um, downstream. Um, but it was a relatively small dam uh, in in the first place, and from an energy generation perspective, I suspect didn't have as much appeal as some of the other ones and, and therefore was, at least for now, it's on, it's, it's, it's on hold. Um, on the uh, ASEAN question, uh, regional power pools, uh, yeah, so this is where, what I hinted at um, in my presentation about the, um, the hardware being kind of the easier part uh, to do, right? A, a grid that's not, that's built in a, in a focused way that, that uh, connects Yunnan's hydro um, to, to uh, solar uh, resources, solar generators in, uh, in Cambodia, um, and that's built in an information and communications sort of in a enabled a smart grid, right, that can sense those drops and can take advantage of, of the, um, the, the hydro reserves upstream um, is part of it, but the, the harder part, uh, given the regional mistrust and given the, um, uh, that you're starting from, from zero really regionally with this, are the, what I called the software, the, the um, innovation in uh, markets for wholesale electricity purchase for ancillary uh, ser uh, services purchase of fre frequency regulation and that sort of thing. Um, and the overall need to recognize that this is a great uh, opportunity Yes, and challenge for um, innovation in the business and financial models, right? Um, uh, that, that 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 sort of underlie um, that that ability for this t t to work. Um, the uh, I had one more thought, but it's gone now. I'll stop there on this. Okay. Can can I actually make a quick addition? So, ASEAN has had a significant challenges overcoming those software side issues. But I do think it's important to recognize that China's already looking to expand transmission capacity to export excess hydropower from Yunnan to Southeast Asia. So there's a bid out um, for building a grid transmission line backbone in Laos that would take some of the excess power from Yunnan and get it to Southeast Asia. Um, what is not happening is a discussion on this coordination aspect. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's an opportunity here for China to potentially play this very useful role that Darren's highlighted in helping meet regional energy needs and in balancing variable renewable energy in the short to medium term um, because that excess capacity is so significant. In, I don't have the most recent figures, but I know in 2016 we'd heard about 150 terawatt hours of hydropower was essentially excess they couldn't find a market for in China, and so it was wasted as, wasted as they let the water pour through the, the, the dam infrastructure and downstream. That's about at the, like two Thailand's worth of electricity, right. or one, one Thailand worth of electricity. And so there's significant opportunity for that to help alleviate some of these pressures in Southeast Asia. 
to both allow for more of a variable renewable build out in the short term and just allow for that technology rollout of battery storage and the other obstacles. Um, but that discussion is not taking place. So there is really significant need for this pressure and this discussion of how energy trade should support renewables in the region because it's not happening right now. Okay, great. Judy? Yeah, um, I'm Judy Shapiro. Um, the whole time that we've been discussing this, I've had in my mind the notion that the audience for all three of your presentations is not in the room. Um, all of you have made uh, great cases from the business perspective, the socioeconomic impacts, uh, um, policy reasons, ecological damages. So, and I think we've already been talking a bit about the way that this gap can be uh, leaped, but I wonder if anybody has any more to add. So you've been talking about the greener Belt and Road. We've heard about local resistance in Thailand, I think, to a coal-fired power plant, um, and so on and so forth. But um, how? who's listening? I, I like that Darren said you met in um, Yunnan with some of the hydro guys who are making the decisions. So. Um, how can we shift this enormous ocean liner before it crashes into the iceberg? <laughs> right. No, it won't crash because the iceberg has melted. <laughs> <laughs> There's a silver lining. Um, I, I, that's a great question. Um, uh, and and uh, let me just say that that meeting in, in Yunnan was convened through the very hard work of, of my colleagues at Stimson uh, Center uh, who have been uh, pushing precisely that uh, trying to push that, that, that needle, move that needle, right? Um, uh, my friend and colleague at uh, Rocky Mountain Institute, Amory Lovins, likes to talk about rearranging mental furniture. Um, and, and I think um, what has to happen here that all three of us have talked about in various ways is, is uh, getting uh, energy companies in the region, in China, to rearrange mental furniture, and, and, and to, to, that is to to stop seeing nails, right? To stop seeing nails that need to be pounded with a hydropower hammer. And I know that, uh, Brian, I hope I'm not betraying any confidences um, here, but I, re I remember a story that, that uh, he recounted of um, sort of having that, 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 that furniture rearrangement happen by, and I've been in, a, <laughs> in, in that same meeting in Kunming, um, where, where there is just such a uh, commitment to, to to hydro as the answer, you know, they look at the, we, we, the United States has a lot of dams, right? You know this, and we've dammed pretty much every technically and politically feasible stretch of river that we have, uh, minus the Grand Canyon, and we came really close to that. Um, and, and so, you know, Europeans and Chinese and Indians, you know, dam people, they look at the United States and say, look at the correlation between the dams you've built and the, and, and the levels of economic development you've achieved, right? And there's this, 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 this causality that, that appears there magically where they assume that dams are such a, a crucial part of the, the picture. Um, and I think getting, it, it's not a, it is steering a ship, right? I mean, because the juggernaut of the Chinese hydraulic engineering universities, uh, graduate schools, and sort of corporate oversupply. I mean, literally, you, you talk about overcapacity in that field. They've gone from it's not just about exporting hydroelectricity across the, the border of Vietnam or Laos with, with transmission line. It is, it is indeed very um, much about the export of hydro expertise. And we did this, you know, the United States did this in our time uh, in the first half of the, the 20th century and, and uh, shocking, I know. Um, uh, and, and, and so I, I think now to the extent that we can get dam planners, dam builders, dam engineers, uh, to listen to our damn stories um, about about how those impacts do accumulate and how they accrue and how they are so kind of coming back to what Hutao asked earlier, how they are so geographically concentrated and acute, right? The negative impacts are acute for those people living nearest the dams, and the benefits, very real, are much more geographically ge geographically diffuse, um, and. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it takes a lot of conversations in private, in forums where that, 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 are, that are building on trust, built over time with, with colleagues. You, you, you've worked in China long enough to know that, that those conversations don't start from zero and ramp up right away. Um, I agree it's a hard, it's a really hard uh, road to hoe.
<laughs> and I, I also take your point about our audience here. I mean, I'll briefly say, I've been having these conversations a lot out, more outside of China than in China in recent years, and that fits also with the kind of shrinking space for civil society in China that, you know, you, you know very well that there was a, a kind of a green public sphere, as some people have, have called it, that was actually quite dynamic in the past sort of decade or so. The space for that and for international collaboration is... is um, smaller than it once was, it exists, and, you know, one can, can, as, you know, mentioned, put out recommendations that do maybe get heard and, and covered uh, at moments like the Belt and Road Forum and so on. But the kinds of conversations we've been able to have, including, say, with Stimson colleagues in, in Yangon or in Bangkok and so on, are quite, actually quite productive and do include Chinese actors, you know, um, uh, researchers, government-linked researchers, officials will come and talk about um, China's impact on the ground in, in the Mekong, um, in, in places, I think particularly Thailand and Myanmar are interesting because they are places that hedge between uh, the US and China and thus in that sort of political fissure you find a little bit of that zone where you can have a, a slightly more open conversation. And, uh, and I've seen some quite interesting and, and constructive conversations happening about the BRI and I think it's part of the, the, the general, or, or about Chinese investment, let's call it more, more broadly. And I think it's part of where that sort of impetus for a bit of a rethink um, comes from is, is, is how in recipient countries um, the, the conversation starts being reframed and people you know, on the ground start asking difficult questions about the, the, the model of investment that's, uh, that's coming in from China, from other uh, donors as well, and, and thinking about how it could be more inclusive or greener and so on. So, you know, I hope that, that that also helped. I mean, clearly you need good conversations in China too, but I do think that some of those conversations outside China can help to reframe the, the debate a bit. Yeah, and I, I know Darren and Sam both sort of touched on this, but we've, we've engaged with both of them in Southeast Asia. So our Southeast Asia program goes and spends almost 20% of our time in the region working with a variety of stakeholders, Chinese stakeholders from dem companies and others who are working in Southeast Asia and also local policymakers. And I'll, I'll just note sort of in addition to the points they made that it is important to have these points coming not only from American and, and European voices, but from local voices in the region. Um, if it's just America coming in and critiquing the Belt and Road, that's not going to have the impact that having local stakeholders from Vietnam or Thailand, Cambodia or Laos raising the same concerns and exploring alternatives where China still plays a key role in the region's energy buildup in a more positive way. And so uh, one, of, one of our biggest focuses in this area is not only doing this type of engagement and analysis here, but working with local partners in these countries who can sort of take a local perspective and move these conversations forward in a way that we wouldn't be able to. And that's what I've seen amongst, I mean, I'm going to be, I, one reason, I mean, I hold some of these meetings here because it's also important, I think, to let the DC policy community, we webcast it, we blog and stuff, to kind of know what is the lay of the land, what's happening in, on, on those belts and roads that everyone's traversing. And that, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. And I think this also offers kind of opportunities for, for some other organizations to know who to partner with. But I definitely seen the trend like they just noted. And, you know, we're hoping to do this as well as to go, China Environment Forum also wants to go down the Belt and Road actually going to, 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 find, to find local partners and, and, to, and to tell these stories. And yeah, I mean, there's um, Vermont Law School, you're on the Belt and Road too. Um, yeah, so um, to end up, because I think it, we're, we're going to wrap up here, I, I'd, I'd like, Darren's going to tell his favorite China electricity story, which kind of brings us back to, it's not just about renewables, right? Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of, um, Yes, yeah, I mean, if you, if, so, so, so the story um, is, Wait, uh, hold that story for 30 seconds. One more point to, to what Judy asked just now, and that is that uh, I noticed that your article was published with Chinese colleagues, right? Uh, the, the article, or the, you referenced the 100 terawatt hours of excess electricity in, in, um, in Yunnan a few years back, a uh, colleague, Toma, uh, Tomas Hennig and I, and some Chinese colleagues at Yunnan University co-authored that. We've written pieces for, um, for China Dialogue and sister publications. And so there are Chinese uh, scholars who are influential in the decision making and the planning and, the, and who have experience in those, in those worlds um, who are willing to, to publish um, on, on these issues and engage in thoughtful conversations on them. And so I, I think that's where we have our biggest, um, I guess, point of, point of leverage, right? Understanding the process as best we can, the black box, unpacking that black box of decision making.
and then and then pushing on the lever points as we as we uh, understand them. Let me interject. I actually had a friend from Chinese Academy of Science, and I need to talk to him next week. Who said Jennifer? You know, because he he was inspired by my uh, our choke point China work, looking at mm. water energy nexus, mm. so coal's water footprint, and and looking at energy's water footprint. Energy's, I mean, I'm sorry, water's energy footprint. And he said, Jennifer, let's go on the Belt and Road. I'm like, really? Which country? He said, I want to do choke point analyses on the BRI. I said, well, which country? He said, all of them. Nice. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, and the Chinese Academy of Science has received a big chunk of change to do a lot of work on gathering data on environmental stuff in the Belt and Road countries. I mean, this, again, I, it's, again, not the most transparent developments happening, but the fact that, again, someone's reaching out to me saying, like, we like your choke point model. Let's go do it on the Belt and Road. I'm like, okay. So it, it just shows you that there's a lot of interest within the research community, and that's going to be important mm -hmm. to hopefully get it to the right people. Mm -hmm. All right, you're going to wrap us up with the light bulb Sure, today? last story. So in 2008, the Energy Research Institute in China, which is a, uh, the, the research arm of the, of the um, Energy Research Arm of the National uh, Development Reform Commission, published a study that, that I find uh, so um, telling and so inspiring in some ways, and, and they mapped out scenarios <coughs> assuming <coughs> excuse me, assuming then that incandescent light bulbs, Thomas, and Thomas Edison's light bulbs, would be phased out completely in, by 2020 in China. And they mapped out a couple of scenarios. Most of them are gone by now. The light bulbs, not the scenarios. Mapped out a couple <laughs> of scenarios going out <coughs> to 2020 um, for different levels of penetration of compact fluorescence uh, and LEDs. Um, and the, uh, the one assumed, uh, you know, sort of 30% uh, penetration of LEDs because they were really pricey at that time still, and that most of the, the space for lighting would be taken up by CFLs. And then the more ambitious scenario, uh, so a term we came up with yesterday, business as unusual, um, the more ambitious scenario um, <clears throat> assumed the kinds of price breakthroughs, cost breakthroughs that we, that we now know are possible, uh, and we've seen them recently in solar and, and wind, um, uh, solar especially, largely, largely driven by China, assume that those price breakthroughs would lead to a penetra high penetration rate of LEDs, so up to 70% LEDs in the lighting mix by 2020. Um, and at that higher LED penetration rate, that, that, that led to a, um, a savings um, of, of roughly 85 billion kilowatt hours per, uh, per year of electricity consumption, just for, for lighting, right? Um, huge numbers that don't make sense to most of us, um, uh, except when you think about it, that that's roughly the equivalent of the annual output of the Three Gorges Dam, right? And so that, therein lies the joke, how many light bulbs does it take to change right. China? Um, but but the, the point is that there is a real uh, resource in, in efficiency, right, in dealing with that end-use efficiency. When you have gains of, of, um, of, uh, of efficient, in efficiency, you know, 10 or 12-fold gains at the end of the line, then the inefficiencies that started way back at the beginning of the line and the generation of that electricity go away and, in, and the savings get magnified just by those, the fact that compounding inefficiencies in one direction turn into compounding efficiencies in the other. So, dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun. All right. <laughs> um, thank my speakers, please, with one more round of applause. And, uh, yeah, I want to thank, you know, Stimson. We were the ones that kind of, we kind of brainstormed, like, yeah, let's, let's get Darren and Sam will be in town. Let's, you know, so I tackled all these people at once. And you guys came and you listened. You asked good questions. You can still tackle them. I want to thank the Luce Foundation for supporting me these days. And um, see you all around at our next meeting. Follow our email. Thank you. Bye-bye.